Good morning. That music kind of had me jamming. If I could dance, I might have busted out in the mood, but anyway, no, God says don't do that. We're glad that you're here. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. We hope that you have felt welcome in coming into this place. Um, if you have an order of worship, hopefully in your hands and on the front, it tells you who we are. We are Grace United Methodist Church, and it tells you what we have been called to do as a church, and that is to go and make disciples, each and every one of us to go and teach another in making a disciple. We believe as a church, as a whole, we can best make disciples through Christian education, worship, missions, youth and children's ministries, and we are just glad that you are here with us this morning, that you've chosen to be here this morning. If you open up your order of worship, you'll see a list of things going on in the life of the church this week and this week's calendar. Um, today, immediately following worship, we're having Grace on Wheels. Grace on Wheels is a ministry and mission of this church in which we have meals prepared and they will be taken out into the community to those who are hungry. And um, if you have not, if you have never partic participated with Grace on Wheels, we invite you to do that. If you have, we invite you to be a part of it again and uh, as we go and we deliver meals and share with those who are hungry. If you are a part of the Nominations and Lay Leadership Committee, uh, please be reminded we have a meeting this Tuesday, 5.30, in the conference room. It should last no longer than an hour. So if you're a part of that committee, please be present. If you open up um, your order of worship all the way, you will see a, a lot of things going on in the life of the church. A few things that I do want to point out. Um, the Clemson, Carolina Peanut Butter Drive. And maybe you're thinking, why in the world are we collecting peanut butter? It is a staple food group, for one. But the other is that Grace United Methodist Church is a, uh, is, we're, we're the peanut butter church, just put it to you that way. Um, and, and we are responsible as a church for making sure peanut butter gets to the food pantry here in Abbeville. And um, so we're having a little competition right now. Carolina's winning. Y'all don't have to clap every time I say that. Um, you did? You switched? Thank you. I, that's why I trust you as my father-in-law, to switch the signs on the peanut butter so Clemson has more. Got you. All right. Um, if you're a youth, please be reminded, youth, we're having a fifth quarter Friday night, October the 3rd, here immediately after the football game. And um, also Friday, October the 3rd is our annual chicken plate sale. If you have not purchased your tickets for that, please do so. And then um, a note that I do want to make is... Sunday, October the 5th, we are going back to one service. There was an email sent out this week in which I explained everything and the details, but I'm, and I'm not going to do that here now. I'm going to highlight just a little bit. Um, this past worship, this past Sunday, our worship committee met, and we made a tough decision, and the tough decision was after a year almost of two worship services, the early service was not bearing the fruit that we wanted it to bear. And, and in a way, we felt the church was kind of divided, so um, we want to go back to one service. It's going to be at 11 o'clock. Some of you are thinking, why not 1030? We can get to the restaurant before the Baptists get there. But um, we found, too, that being at 11 o'clock is a more consistent time in the mindset of uh, when you attend church. And when we had 1030 worship service, there were a lot of times that uh, folks would come in 20, 30 minutes late. So we're going to have worship at 11 o'clock, one service beginning October the 5th. Sunday school will be at 9.45, so just want you to, to be aware of, of that change that's going on, and there'll be more information publicized throughout the church so that you can have more explanation if you need it. All right, two more things, and I'll be quiet for a little bit. Um, inside your order of worship is a card. If you're a first-time guest with us, second-time guest with us, we want you to please check that and make sure we have your information. Uh, if you're a regular attender or a church member and your church information or your um, personal information has changed, Please let us know so that we can stay in contact with you, stay in check with you. If you flip it over on the back, you'll see a spot for uh, prayer requests and, and comments. If you want to uh, turn that in with some prayer requests, we'll definitely be praying for you. And then also, um, it's, all, it's always our hope as a church that you will take a next step in your faith journey. And, and we want to walk with you in that journey. We want to help hold each other accountable. So if, if you have, after today's service, if you have a next step, you know, include that on your way out this morning. There will be some baskets, and ushers will have some baskets. You just place the card in the basket, and, um, and we'll take it from there. But I want you to be aware of that. Final thing, September is our In His Steps um, drive. In His Steps is a, is a way for members and attenders here at Grace to find a place in ministry because it is our belief that if you are a 
Christian, if you are a disciple, whether or not you remember is irrelevant, really. Um, but if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're expected to serve in some way. And there is a place for everyone to serve. No matter how young or how old you may be, there's a place to serve here at Grace. And so if you have not picked up one of these yet and filled one of these out, please do so. We're going to be turning them in um, the first Sunday of October. That's it. That's all I have. I'm tired from announcements. Let's stand and let's worship together this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we 
are indeed thankful for your faithfulness, Lord. We are thankful for being able to come together this morning to worship freely, Lord, to serve you greater in everything that we say and do, God. And that's our challenge this morning, God, as we open up our hearts and minds to you. Lord, I pray that we would be ready to receive not only from the songs this morning, Lord, but from the music, from the scripture. Um, just whatever you need to do this morning, God, I pray that you would move in the hearts of the people here. And Lord, we just thank you for the blessings that you have been providing for us. We thank you for this church family and, and what you're doing in the lives of your people. And God, may we be reminded to pray to you as you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thou is the King, power and glory forever. Amen. At this time, I would ask um, Charles and Beth and Briley, if you would come forward, and Chad and Chandra, and your family, Aaron and Brittany, if you guys would come forward. As today, as we celebrate baptism and new members, um, this is a time for the church to celebrate and what God is doing in the lives of his people here at Grace. Now remind us about baptism. We have a lot of water up here this morning, so let me kind of share what all this is about. We have water from home. Water from the home of Charles and Beth, for Riley, and we have water from the home of Chad and Chandra for their family, Chandra, Aaron, and Brittany. Then we have water from the church. Because it's our belief and teaching that baptism does not save us, but baptism is an initiation into Christ's church. And with baptism, we remember the work of God through water. That when nothing existed but chaos, God swept across the dark waters with his Holy Spirit, and he brought forth life and light. In the days of Noah, God saved Noah and his family through the water. And as God's own children, the Israelites, were as slaves in Egypt, and they cried out to God, God, save us from our slavery, free us. It's through the water that God brought them freedom and God brought them to life. And then in God's own perfect timing, God sent his son Jesus who was nurtured by water in the womb. And Jesus came and Jesus called his disciples and he called them to baptism. A baptism that lived into his life, his death and his resurrection. And, and Jesus calls us too to baptism. And so today, we pour these waters. Reminded that God works, can you hold that for me? Thank you, ma'am. That God works through water. It is a mystery in how God cleanses and how God promises us life. Great job. And so it is my prayer that over this water, Holy Spirit, that you will bless Briley, that you will bless her family that you would bless Chandra and Aaron and Brittany, and that you would bless their family. Lord, as they come today to proclaim you as Savior, and they come today to join this church, we thank you, Lord. Be at work in their life. Draw them closer to you. Cleanse them of their sin. And God, may they walk this life with you into eternity. Amen. All right, Riley, if you will come first, please, ma'am. Now, I'm going to ask you two questions, okay? Now, the first one is, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? All right. Riley Hawthorne, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And you are God's child. And now, will you serve this church with your prayers and your presence and your gifts and your service and your witness? Well, see, today is a celebration day because she has confessed her faith in Jesus Christ and she has joined the church and saying, I'm, I may be young, but I can serve this church and I'm a member of grace. So, Briley, we welcome you to the family, sweetheart. Y'all may clap for Briley. Okay, Miss Chandra 
Aaron and Brittany, if y'all want to come over too. I will ask you all together at the same time, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Okay. Chandra, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you are God's child. Aaron, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and you are God's child. Brittany, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and you are God's child. And I ask you three now, will you serve this church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Welcome to grace. Thank you. Let us stand together and let us join together in reminding ourselves the essential truths of the Christian faith. These truths that have been passed down from generation to generation in the life of the church. Reminding the church who we are and the truths of who we are. Let us join together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. While you're up, take a moment, greet those around you. Welcome them to grace.
seated. At this point in time, let us continue worshiping God with God's tithe and our offering. And we have this time in the service every week to um, give back to God, to respond back to God, how God has given and provided for us. And we remember this principle every week, this truth really, is that we are never more like God than when we are giving. And it is God who has made us in God's own image, and it was God who has called us to be like His Son, Jesus. And we want to be like Jesus. If we want to be like Jesus, then we think, Jesus, you gave all the time. And it's not just about giving of money. It's it's giving of self. So as we have this opportunity to give, let us ask ourselves the question, how can I give my whole self to you, God, more every day? Let us pray together. Gracious God, we thank you that you give. And God, you provide and you give us everything that we need every day. God, the breath that we just breathed, you gave it. Lord, the greatest that you have given is your son, Jesus Christ, for all the world. And today, Lord, we take this opportunity to give back to you. God, your tithe, our offering. And God, we give in response to your love. But God, we also give knowing that it is in the giving and the receiving of the tithe and offering here at this church that we're able to send that money, those resources back out into the world. God, into this community, to this state, to this nation, and to this world so that more people come to know and learn of the grace and love of Jesus Christ our Lord. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. And if you could please stand as we present God's tithes and our offerings.
you may be seated. Children are now dismissed to Children's Church. Scripture this morning comes from Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Hear the word of God. Teacher, which commandment in law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all law and the prophets. The word of God, people of God. Praise be to God.
We played that video for the past two weeks in the sermon series that we are in right now. The sermon series that we're in right now is called Extraordinary, and the part that before it just kicks in like, you know, that part, um, there, there's a, just words coming up, and it's talking about, you know, you're a child of God, and you're meant for so much more. You're meant for an extraordinary life, a life like Jesus. And that's why we've been showing that video every week. Because that's, as the church, that's what we're meant for. We're meant for more than just ordinary. We're meant for more than just mediocre. We're meant for a life like Jesus, and that is going to be an extraordinary life. And so we've taught for the past two weeks about living an extraordinary life. And we began with the thought that you know, one of the first things that we should understand and know and what makes us extraordinary is that we are loved. We are loved by God. And when we become to the knowledge of, of that love that God has for us and we accept that love, and then it's our responsibility as a church to live an extraordinary life and that we love others like Jesus loves. And then so last week we talked about we belong, and belonging to God makes us extraordinary in knowing that we are God's children and that we belong to God. And so we left last week with the question of if we know that we belong to God, then how will my life demonstrate it? And we're going to talk a little bit about that today, hopefully give some answers. So if you left here last week thinking, how can my life demonstrate that I belong to God? We're going to try to give some answers today. Um, so how you'll know that you belong to God and, and your life will, will, reveal, will reveal that and reflect that in everything you do. But here's what I've come to understand about life. Is this not a sprint, it's a marathon. And as I think about that, I, I had a conversation with a good friend of mine this past week. His name is Derek. Um, in fact, he's here today. Good to see you, buddy. But uh, so uh, talking with Derek, and he, he's, you know, he, he's done the whole marathon thing. He's done the triathlon thing. If it's got a fawn at the end of it, he's probably done it. Um, but he is actually training right now for an Ironman triathlon next month. Ironman triathlon, just so we all are on the same page. And I want to be absolutely sure that I got this right. So I said, Derek, you've got to tell me what all this is about. And he said, well, it starts with a 2.4-mile swim. I said, no, nah. put me in a boat. I'll be good. 2.4-mile swim, 26.1-mile run. I mean, that's a full marathon. And then you finish it off with a 112-mile bike ride. I'm like, dude, are you crazy? Glutton for punishment. What's up? And, and I'm thinking in my mind, he's telling me all this. I'm like, 2.4 miles of swimming? After a few laps in the pool, I will swim like a rock. I can't imagine 2.4 miles of swimming. And then you're thinking 26.1 miles of running. I'm at best 2.6 miles of running. And then 112 miles, I'm not going to give you 65 on a bike. But, I, but in this conversation, I said, all right, well, here's what I need you to help me understand that in preparing for this, this marathon, triathlon deal, I mean, what do you do, what do you not do that ordinary people do? He's like, well, ordinary people wouldn't train. He's been training for over a year now for this race next month. And so it's, it's, it's every day, discipline, consistent training. And then we start talking about not only the exercise aspect, but the diet of it, you know, eat what's good for you, stay away from the bad stuff. I'm like, eh, okay. Um, so eat what's good for you, stay away from the bad stuff. That's not what ordinary people do. We want the bad stuff and the good stuff just for decoration on the plate. And then train, train, train. And, and as he's talking, he's sharing, you know, here's the deal, is that my goal is to finish the race. And in finishing the race, it's a process. But he, he also said, you know, when, when he knows he's been consistent and disciplined in his training, he knows he's prepared for it. And he will reach the finish line. And all the stuff that leads up to the race, all this training, he said, is a process and a lifestyle. Process, lifestyle. And we finished the conversation, and, and, and I got to thinking, you know, of course, he's been training for almost a year, right at a year now, and nobody in their right mind would just jump right in and say, you know what, I'm going to do this Ironman next month, and I've got two weeks to prepare. It's training. It's a process. It's a lifestyle. And after that conversation, I got to thinking, this reflects a whole lot 
the Christian life. Because in reality, this whole marathon deal, not a sprint, that's the Christian life. That's what God's called us to. And, but here's, here's the tension that we as Christians have. The tension is this. A lot of times, we get the starting line and the finish line confused. Here's what I mean. The starting line is confessing faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And, and we realize that. We need a Savior. We confess it. We find out we get to go to heaven when we die. And we think, that's it. Everything's great. I'm done. And, and if you think that is the finish line, you can never be more wrong in your life. Because that's just the starting line. In fact, the finish line, and hang with me here, I would suggest to us the finish line is not even going to heaven. You're like, what? That's got to be the finish line. No, that's a perk of the finish line. The finish line goes back to that video, an extraordinary life, a life like Jesus. As disciples of Jesus Christ, our finish line should be at some point in our life we find out that we are living exactly like Jesus lived. And I've got news for you. We're not there yet. And in living like Jesus lived, we bring a little bit of heaven to earth instead of just waiting to go to heaven. And so, it's a marathon. And I know Derek's going to do all that in one day. And it would take me a week to do all that, at least. But the same principle applies in our Christian faith. It's a marathon. And you're not going to do it all today. It's an everyday thing. And so our takeaway point today is that we are extraordinary when we live our faith every day. Not just on Sunday, but every day. And it's consistent, disciplined practice, training, process, lifestyle. And again, you can't do it all today, but you can take a step today to go toward that finish line in the marathon. And so, this whole tension that we've talked about of getting the starting line and the finish line confused. This is not anything new for God's people, for the church. In fact, Paul wrote a letter to the Thessalonian church. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. As you're turning there, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about what's going on in the Thessalonian church. So Paul wrote them a letter, and, and Paul writing a letter dealing with an issue that every Christian from Jesus' day to now have a basic belief, and we have this basic belief because Jesus said it. Jesus says, hey, I'm going away, but I'm coming back. And so the church is believing Jesus is coming back, and they're thinking two minutes from now or next week. But the church, in waiting for Jesus to come back, decides to just get lazy, to just sit around, to do nothing, to say, I'm going to heaven, and that's great. And so Paul write, writes this letter to the Thessalonian church, and we get to kind of read the mail, so to speak, this letter that Paul wrote to them. We get a little glimpse of what's going on, and Paul was just really telling the church, you know what, it's, having faith in Jesus is a whole lot more than just waiting around for Jesus to come back. In fact, having faith in Jesus is more than just knowing that you're going to heaven someday. But Paul wanted to push the Thessalonian church that having faith in Jesus was that while you're waiting for Jesus to come back, you have work to do. And that work that you're to do is to be like Jesus and in being like Jesus just what if you actually bring a glimpse of heaven to earth and so we begin with Paul's words to the Thessalonians and some of these words are kind of tough just to be honest with you Paul's speaking some truth and love but he is really encouraging this church to step up and to find themselves living more like Jesus and as we read these words I want you to consider these things as training, that if you begin to put these things into your life as a process and a lifestyle, you will be running this marathon and living out your faith every day. So hear these words from the Apostle Paul, verses 12 and 13. And now, friends, we ask you to honor those leaders who work so hard for you, who have been given the responsibility of urging and guiding you along in your obedience. Overwhelm them with appreciation and love. So let's stop right there. Paul is starting out. And he's dealing with some issues because there's been some kind of revolting against the leaders of the church. And Paul says, let me, let, me, let me tell you this, Thessalonian church. Let me remind you. Honor and appreciate the leaders who are working in the church for you. And he goes on. He says, you know, because it's a calling, it's a responsibility of those people there. And their calling and their responsibility is to urge you and to guide you in your faith. Now, being a leader in a church... I can kind of see where Paul's going with this. Because sometimes it's like herding cats to urge 
a church together to do something. All the while, sometimes darts are being thrown at you while you're trying to herd the cats. And so Paul is encouraging the church. Listen, you have leaders. Encourage them. Give them support. Honor them. Love them. And so, you know, to make this personal for us, maybe the question is, when was the last time you told one of the staff here how much you appreciate them? Or maybe, when was the last time you were in actual conversation with someone, and it was a positive conversation, and not a complaining conversation about the staff, me, ministries of the church? Just saying. Just saying. Because all too often, and I, and I throw myself in this mix too, all too often we church folk complain more than celebrate. But I'll move on from that one. Look at verses 13 through 15. Paul says, and he, here's something else you need to put into practice. Here's another process lifestyle. Here's some more training for you. Paul says, get along among yourselves, each of you doing your part. Our counsel is that you warn the freeloaders to get a move on. Gently encourage the stragglers and reach out for the exhausted, pulling them to their feet. Be patient with each person, attentive to individual needs, and be careful that when you get on each other's nerves, you don't snap at each other. Look for the best in each other, and always do your best to bring it out. And so Paul goes on, he says, all right, now, I've addressed the whole deal about church leaders. Church members, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get along with each other. Get over yourself, get along with each other, get over your pride, and each of you do your part. I like that. And I like how he says, each of you do your part. And I wonder, and I've got it in parentheses in my notes, but I wonder if each of you did your part, would there be as much complaining? Just, just wondering. Anyway, and then he goes on. He says, all right, and for the freeloaders, those of you who are just wanting something for nothing, he said, he said move them on. And then the, the stragglers. The ones who are getting lazy in their faith, the ones who are lagging behind, Paul says gently encourage them. He's like, what, what would that look like? I can tell you what that would look like. That would look like those of you who are consistently in a, some kind of small group of a Sunday school or a Bible study, and you know people who are not, you gently encourage them. You really need to start coming. I mean, I'm glad you're in worship, but you really want to grow? Get in a Bible study. Get connected with a group. That's what that might look like in our terms. And then he goes on, and those who are exhausted, reach out to them. Pull them to their feet. Those who are burnt out, help them out. And then he says, be patient with each person, attentive to individual needs. That's important because every one of us are our own individuals, and we have our own individual needs as a church family. And so Paul says, be patient with each other and be attentive to individual needs. And then he says, and I like this, not if, but when, when you get on each other's nerves. And let's just be honest. We can get on each other's nerves, can't we? Can't we? Tom, you can shake it. Yeah, we, we can get on each other's nerves because we're family. We're church family. And Paul recognizes that when he's writing to the Thessalonians. He says, you know what? Y'all are going to get on each other's nerves, but here's what I don't want you to do. When you get on each other's nerves, don't snap at each other. Don't lose composure. Just, just work through it. And one of the best ways you can work through it, Paul says, is, is find the best in each other and always do your best to bring it out. So don't snap to find the best of e in each other. And he goes on. He says, be cheerful no matter what, or be joyous or joyful no matter what. And he says, pray all the time. Thank God no matter what happens. This is the way God wants you who belong to Christ Jesus to live. And so Paul is writing out more in this training plan. He says, here's what I want you to do too. I want you to be joyful. I want you to be cheerful no matter what happens. Don't let things of this world steal your joy because your joy comes from who you are and belonging to God. Your joy comes from Jesus Christ. Don't let the world rob you of that. And he says, pray all the time. And some of us may think, pray all the time. How can I pray all the time? I, mean, I can't get down on my knees and pray all the time. Or from driving down the road, you surely don't want to close your eyes while you're praying and you're driving. But Paul, I think more than just praying, Paul is stressing relationship with God. Be intentional about your relationship with God and don't let that go astray. Don't let the things of this world pull you and distract you and take away your time and your relationship with God. So pray all the time. And then Paul says, thank God no matter what happens. Whatever happens in your life, find a reason to thank God, Paul says. 
And then he closes that thought with this. This is the way God wants you who belong to Christ Jesus to live. So it links right back to where we were last week. How is your life demonstrating that you belong to God? And Paul says, this is how God wants you who belong to Christ Jesus to live. Then he continues with his training regiment for this marathon. Don't suppress the spirit. Don't stifle those who have a word from the master. On the other hand, don't be gullible. Check out everything and keep only what's good. Throw out anything tainted with evil. And so Paul is telling the church there, he says, all right, here's something else I want you to know. Don't suppress the spirit. Don't let what you want to do get in the way of what God wants to do through you, in you, and around you. Because God will do mighty things through you, Thessalonian church, if you will just get out the way and let God do his deal. But then he says, don't be gullible either. Don't let just any passing wave come in your way change your mind. Instead, test it. Check it out. And one way we can do that is see if it lines up with Scripture or not. If it's good, keep it. If it doesn't line up with Scripture, toss it out. And then he closes this training plan with these words. May God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole. Put you together, spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our Master Jesus Christ. The one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he'll do it. And what Paul is giving to the Thessalonians is almost an oh, by the way mentality. All right, I'm closing everything up, so oh, by the way, remember this. God himself, the one who makes everything holy and whole, is the same one who's going to make you holy and whole, which is, by the way, what you're supposed to be working towards in this marathon. That is the finish line, making you holy and whole like Jesus. And, and as for this, the Jesus coming back that you've been waiting around on Thessalonian church, believe me, he will come back. But until he does, be at work in being coming holy and whole as God is doing the work in you. And you do that by living out this training plan that Paul has given to the Thessalonian church. And then he closes with the reminder the one who called you to this race is dependable. It's a marathon. But the one who called you to it is dependable. If he said it, he'll do it. That's what Paul said. And so we read all these words and we think, well, so what, Jason? What does all this mean to us? What does all this mean for us? What does this mean for me? Well, really, these words that Paul shared, they go against the grain when it comes to living normal, mediocre, and ordinary way of life. These ways are extraordinary in living. And it's a reminder that you can't do it all at once. It's, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And I think Paul knew, because Paul was human, and we know that these things run against the grain of what is, what is normal, what is ordinary. Because as humans, we tend to complain more than celebrate. Paul touched on that. We have a hard time getting along with each other. Paul touched on that. A lot of times we get all, I'll say it, drawers in a wad, and we just want to take our toys and go home. And Paul says, don't do that. Get along with each other. And he says, you know, some of you, you've you just been shirking responsibility. You're refusing to do your part. And when you refuse to do your part, then you complain that nothing happens. He says, you're impatient with each other. And when you get on each other's nerves, don't snap at each other. And don't get people to form up on your side and get an alliance against the annoying person. We can do that easy too. He says, look for the best in others. And he says, don't, don't allow things in this world, things that really don't matter at the end of the marathon, things that don't matter at all, Paul says. Don't allow these things to steal your joy. Don't allow things like crazy traffic to steal your joy. How many of you get road rage? Whee! Don't allow that to steal your joy. And then he goes on, in essence, he's saying, when he says pray all the time, don't allow the things of the world and the daily distractions to hinder your relationship and your prayer time with God. And I've got a note in my notes in talking about hindering our relationship and prayer time with God. By the way, I don't think saying, oh God, what now is prayer? Especially when you're at work and a coworker comes to you and you think, oh my God, what now? Or your kids cry out, mom and daddy, like, oh my God, what now? Or your spouse says, hey, can you do this? You're like, oh my God. That's not prayer. And 
And so really, with all that's going on in this world, with all that's going on in your life, God has called you and God has called us to so much more. God has called us out of ordinary to extraordinary, to live a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called. And to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior is the starting line. And that's a great starting line, but it's not the finish line. In fact, it's the first step at the starting line. And we're in a marathon. And again, the finish line is not just to get to heaven when you die. But more, the finish line is our lives becoming more like Jesus' life every day. And our lives playing a part in bringing a glimpse of heaven to this broken and dying world. And it's a marathon. And we're going to have to put these things into practice that Paul listed out for the Thessalonian church. They're for us too. And if we want to finish this race in becoming more like Jesus every day, if we want to show that we belong to God, if we want to demonstrate our life, to demonstrate that we belong to God, Paul was saying this is how, it, how you demonstrate it. You go into training. You put these things into practice. It's a process. It's a lifestyle. And if you want to finish the race of becoming like Jesus, if you want to be extraordinary, we live our faith every day. And I've learned throughout my somewhat athletic life that if you want a goal, if you want to achieve something, make a goal. Write it down. Tell somebody. Hold each other accountable. And when it comes to your Christian exercise and training, don't hinder the Spirit. Stay faithful in the God who is completely dependable will work in you and through you. And I realize and I understand that that word from Paul is a lot. You read it and you hear it and you think, great day in the morning. He just gave us a training I can never achieve. And you're right, you cannot do it in one day, but you can start taking steps today to get there. And I also want to let you know that it is not easy. It is not. The easy thing is just to follow the normal, ordinary, mediocre way of living. But God says you're more than that. I've called you to more than that. I've called you to be extraordinary. And it's not easy. Sometimes it's painful. Just like that Iron Man's going to be. But you know you've done the training for it. And as a church, when it comes to living our life more every day like that of Jesus, it's not easy. It's painful at times because it means swallowing our pride. It means loving the unlovable. It means offering forgiveness instead of retaliation. But Jesus says, you're extraordinary. And when you live your faith every day, you're extraordinary. And that's what we've been called to be and what we've been called to do is to live our faith every day for the main purpose so that other people will come to know of Jesus Christ. And they too can get in this race that we're in. And it's a marathon. It is a marathon. So today for you, your next step, your what now, all that stuff Paul said, just, just pick one and start. <laughs> all that stuff Paul said, pick one and start. If you're not already doing it, find you one and just start going down the list and start the training. Let us pray together. God of grace and God of mercy, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus for all the world. And God, I ask for your forgiveness that if we have ever considered that as the finish line and not the starting line, but just to believe that and to confess that is the start. The finish, Jesus, is your Holy Spirit at work in us, making us more like you every day of our life, enabling us to live out our faith. God, may we take these words from Paul seriously. May they begin to shape and change our life as we run this race to which you have called us, this race of faith. May we run it together. May we hold each other accountable. May we finish this race of becoming more like you as we live out our faith every day. Amen. And if you could please stand as we sing this last song. It's called It Is Well.
God of all grace and glory and mercy and love and forgiveness and hope and acceptance has called us to live an extraordinary life. And he's called us to go out and to live our faith every day. So may we go in the love and the grace and the mercy and the acceptance and hope of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. And if you could please join hands as we sing, Bind Us Together. Bind us together.